Good evening, folks, and welcome to our public debate. We're excited to have you join us today for a very timely topic. Freedom of expression is a cherished right enshrined in our First Amendment. It is a very fundamental right. Recently, it has become a part of a political firestorm as forces on both sides of the political aisle fight to define the scope of free expression. Many of these fights are taking place in the courts, but they're also taking place across the public sphere, on social media, on the news, in debates over Joe Rogan's podcasts, on the football field where Colin Kaepernick took a knee, in bakeries over cakes, in, tennis, in the Tennessee state legislature, in libraries over books, and also in our classrooms not just K through 12, but also in our universities. Are we at a crisis point? Does something need to be done? Tonight, we'll pick up that conversation with our debate. But first, I wanna tell you a little bit about our program. My name is Adrian Bravero, and I'm the director of the debate program here at UMW. UMW participates in both competitive debates and public debates like this one. UMW debate competes in two forms of competitive debate, policy debate and public forum, and we attend over a dozen tournaments each season. This season, our students have reached the finals at eight tournaments, winning five of them, including the Public Forum Fall Championship and the Georgetown and Naval Academy tournaments in January. Our team is open to both beginners and more experienced debate veterans. Tonight, our debate will involve three of our students. Two of them started debate in college, and one of them is actually in their very first year. Affirming the resolution will be Andrew and Lance. They are both from Virginia and they both started debate in college. This is Andrew's last UMW public debate as he graduates next month. Lance just started this year and this is assuredly not his last debate since he's always looking to jump in for another tournament. <clears throat> Lance and his partner were recognized by the American Debate Association as the top ranked novice team during the regular season. Negating the resolution, will be Avery Dover. Unfortunately, his colleague was not able to make it this evening. But fortunately for us, Avery is ready to debate solo. Avery is from Kansas and just completed his sixth year of debate, having started in high school. And in high school, he did frequently debate in a solo version of debate, Lincoln Douglas. So I think he's more than ready. Uh, Avery and Andrew also qualified to the national debate tournament this season. On a personal note, I would like to thank them all for their hard work preparing for this debate, among all the many other things that they have gone, going on at the end of the semester. I'm very proud of them for all of their hard work. They are joined tonight by our moderator, Gabriel Lewis, who is UMW class of 2019 and a former UMW debater who participated in many public debates in his day. He is now the assistant director of Georgetown's debate team. In his first year at Georgetown, he took the lead on hosting Georgetown's January tournament, as well as the American Debate Association Nationals, all in a span of about eight weeks, and capped off the season with a team in the quarterfinals of the National Debate Tournament, and was selected as our region's critic of the year. We truly appreciate him coming back to support our public debate program by moderating tonight's debate. Welcome, Gabe. Uh, all right, well, good evening, everyone. And thank you to Adrian and the UMW debate team for allowing me to moderate tonight's debate. Uh, the topic for tonight's debate, as previously mentioned, is resolved. Universities in the United States should give greater support to freedom of expression on campus. The format that we will follow for tonight's debate is above on the slide. Uh, if you have questions for the debaters, please submit them in the chat at any point during the debate. Uh, once we get to the audience Q&A period, your questions will be asked. So as you can see, our format for tonight's debate starts with a, the first affirmative constructive, which is a five minute speech, followed by a cross-examination period of four, three minutes. Then we'll have the first negative constructive speech followed by another cross-examination a second affirmative constructive speech followed by a cross-examination, and then the second negative constructive followed by a cross-examination. At that point, like I said, we'll open the floor to audience Q&A for the debaters about their arguments, their evidence, um, or you know, their ideas about the topic. Uh, and then we will conclude with an affirmative and a negative rebuttal, and then an audience voting period. Uh, so with that, I think we are ready to get underway.
Good evening, everyone. My name is Andrew Hudgens, and tonight my partner Lance and I will be affirming the resolution that universities in the United States should give greater support to freedom of expression on campus. In 1860, the great American orator Frederick Douglass delivered one of his finest speeches. In it, he boldly declared that liberty is meaningless where the right to express one's thoughts and opinions has ceased to exist. Today, our liberty is under a threat on college campuses across the United States. Students and teachers are having their right to express themselves curtailed across all campuses. In order to protect our freedom of expression, we affirm the resolution that universities in the United States should give greater support to freedom of expression on campus. Our first contention is that freedom of expression is under attack in academia. To support this, we have three key examples. Our first is banned books. As the American Library Association, the accrediting body for scores of American universities recently noted, book bans more than doubled in 2022 to over 1,200. Book bans are not only fundamental anti-educational, but they also chill publishing and writing, ultimately restricting the transmission of ideas vital to a democratic society. This is an unprecedented attempt by government officials to control and censor what topics can be expressed in classrooms by restricting discussion of topics they deem controversial, such as those about sexuality and race. And this has been happening even at the college level, with the legislatures in both Florida and South Carolina attempting to pass laws to broadly limit what books professors can and can't assign on their syllabi. In doing so, they are directly impeding the ability of students and professors to learn, and more importantly, impeding their First Amendment expression rights. Secondly, we can cite deteriorating dialogue on college campuses. Connor Friesdorf of The Atlantic reports that 70% of conservative students 49% of moderate students, and a quarter of liberal students self-censor in class, afraid that their professors and classmates will cancel their views or insult them for their opinions. Students then take this out on each other in the form of heckling and banning speakers and programs they don't like, as we've seen across universities and law schools with students shouting down speakers whose opinions they disagree with. This lack of dialogue and its replacement by censorship makes a mockery of the idea of the American university as a place where we are all welcome to learn, debate, and ultimately ultimately make our nation a better place. Our third example is punishing professors. For it's not just our university students who are being failed by a lack of support for free expression. University professors are also being censored. Hamlin University recently, quote, committed one of the most egregious violations of academic freedom in recent memory, according to Jeremy Young of PEN America, when they fired an art history professor who had shown their class an image from medieval Islamic art depicting the Prophet Muhammad. While this is taboo for some Muslims today, it was not in medieval times, and the professor intended to demonstrate how beliefs change over time. Ironically, it appears that those in medieval times would have had greater tolerance for this form of free expression than we do today, proving again that our lapse in protecting free expression not only endangers our students, but also their teachers, and that freedom of expression is under constant assault across college campuses. Which brings us to our second contention, that free speech will fail unless we defend it in the universities. Already, we have seen partisan attacks from both sides of the political spectrum calling for a greater control of college speech and expression. According to a recent YouGov poll, 59% of Republicans believe that college professors have too much freedom in how they teach their curricula. Conversely, free speech advocacy group FIRE has found that university speech codes, by using vague and unclear punishments and language, have had a chilling effect on what type of speech students are allowed to engage in, with the broad majority of it being those of the conservative spectrum. This shows that there is a desire to curtail speech at universities and that colleges have an obligation to resist these attempts. Colleges should not prefer one type of speech over another. Rather, they should ensure that freedom of expression remains open so that many different ideas can and will flourish. We have a unique opportunity to reverse this worrisome trend and recommit ourselves to freedom of expression, which as we all know is one of the foundational pillars of our American democracy. And finally, that brings me to our third contention, that promoting critical media literacy and reaffirming a commitment to freedom of expression will be able to solve this. UMW graduate John Hemmler makes the convincing case that if we are to salvage freedom of expression on campuses, we must commit to promoting critical media literacy. His approach would be to tackling people's mindsets and integrating critical media literacy into education. This offers double protection for freedom of speech on campus. It solves for polarization by counteracting headlines that dominate the news while providing a safeguard against the type of radical or offensive ideas that the negative team will no doubt attempt to associate with freedom of expression. Instead of running away from ideas we find uncomfortable to grapple with, we must educate university students to challenge and reject those ideas instead of embrace and instead embrace the concept of fair and open debate. And we should challenge colleges to continue to affirm these principles across their campuses. 
because freedom of expression faces clear and present danger today, because it is necessary to build a better, more just, tolerant, and diverse society, and because promoting critical media literacy and affirming our commitment to free expression is able to bridge the gap to a better tomorrow, you must vote to affirm the resolution. I now open myself up for a cross-examination. Fantastic, Andrew. My first question is, do you have any examples of specific policies by universities that restrict freedom of expression? Well, as we've cited uh, throughout our evidence, we have several examples. One of them, our FIRE research has shown that speech codes across campuses have had a chilling effect on speech by imposing vague and unclear restrictions and punishments. And we've also cited several high-profile individual examples of professors being booted out of their positions for showing images in a purely academic context. And we think those more than qualify. I want to talk about your evidence um, for you that you said was from FIRE. Do you have any mm -hmm. specific instances of codes that you think are bad, or is it just generically that there are some vague codes. I mean, I, the most salient indictments I know of are about, I believe, the Stanford University speech code, where they had a tip line for students to report on like discriminatory content, except students were using it to like snitch on people for reading books that had KKK in the title and stuff like that, when the book was actually about like the civil rights movement. And so that's clearly an example of students being chilled for like just academic, you know, engaging in their education, sure. because these speech codes exist and are overly broad. Sure. My next question is, what do you think it means for a university to have greater support for freedom of expression? Well, we'd say there are multiple ways universities can express this. Um, one of them would be promoting things like critical media literacy to encourage students to engage in debate and analyze arguments rather than just shouting them down. They can also resist things like book bans when they're imposed by the legislature by filing court cases and taking them up to the courts. And we've seen that actually succeed in several cases in Florida and uh, I believe in South Carolina as well. And they can also just re-clarify their uh, freedom of expression codes on speech codes on campuses to ensure that everyone knows that they're, you know, they have voluntary participation programs and that you're not going to be like censored or fined for reading a book assigned by your professor. Sure. I guess that makes sense. Um, my question then becomes, why are universities the ones that should take the burden of stopping the book bans that are happening in the legislature? Well, we'd say universities, uh, as we've indicated, have a unique role in American society of educating our future leaders and that as academic institutions, they have a sort of level of trust of the public that, you know, they can engage in this type of fair and open debate in a way that perhaps politicians can't. And so when these policies are imposed upon them, they can and should resist them by, you know, using their First Amendment rights. Furthermore, I want to ask about this critical media literacy. What do you think forcing students into a critical media literacy class does for them to feel more comfortable and not self-censor? I'd like to push back on the idea that we'd be forcing anyone. Universities have curricula requirements like writing intensive or speaking intensive classes here at the University of Mary Washington to promote ideas they think are useful. And we could just add like a debate intensive class in which you have to analyze different arguments from multiple perspectives and learn how to constructively engage with them. Sure. So you have to take the class to meet the curricula. How does engaging one... with arguments mean that students feel comfortable discussing said arguments? Because the main reason students don't feel comfortable discussing arguments is they're afraid they're just going to get shouted down or like recorded on people's phones and posted onto Twitter. And so if universities can explain from the outset that you're allowed to discuss ideas in an academic context and to adopt opinions that maybe you do or don't agree with, you can have more free and open discussions about them. That's okay. Hi everyone, my name is Avery Dover. I'm a sophomore political science and communications and digital studies double major here at the University of Mary Washington. While acknowledging the voices of the American people is critically important, there's a line between productive free speech and that which serves to harm our democracy. As they stand, American universities are a critical forum for fruitful discussion about the future of politics, society, race relations, and more. The affirmative plan is not only necessary for unnecessary for the facilitation of productive discussion, but it would also open the door to massively controversial policies and hate speech towards minorities. This leads me to my first contention which is that there's no crisis now. For the affirmative to win this debate, they must convince you that without a doubt, there is a free speech cri crisis happening in American universities. And unfortunately for them, that's just not true. First, from Professor Bradford Vivian, universities are the best protectors of free speech and diversity today. He writes this in 2022. Cycles of manufactured outrage about students' protests on college campuses reflect exceedingly selective focus when it comes to free speech and academic freedom. Sigal Ben Poraf, a professor of education and political science and philosophy, observes controversies over campus free speech that animate public debate occur outside of class. Yet the most meaningful and productive opportunities for discussion, the development of knowledge and the free exchange of ideas occur inside the four walls of the classroom. 
Secondly, the affirmative use of polls to support their arguments should be viewed with skepticism because those polls are manipulated for flashy news headlines, again from Professor Bradford Vivian in 2022. Agents of campus misinformation often seek to prove their pseudo-diagnoses of college students by relying on public opinion survey research. Political science Lance Binet adds that communication strategists commonly use polls to get their message into the news to create the impression of broader credibility. For this reason, opinion polls themselves tend to follow the language of political spin. Much of the public is now accustomed to accepting broad, after-the-fact summaries of survey research from reporters and pundits. This section illustrates the value of questioning headlines and secondhand commentaries about individual opening surveys. Survey results express concerns about college students' understanding of the First Amendment and their tolerance of free speech rights, and agents of campus misinformation seized on this finding to promote sweeping generalizations about college students that went far beyond the limited data of the study itself. A headline in the Weekly Standard hyperbolically claimed that surveys confirms what many suspected, free speech is in trouble. The Wall Street Journal editorial board substituted melodrama for measured reporting about the survey entitled James Madison Weeps. This leads us to my second contention. The narrative of the affirmative is dangerous and misleading. We are not arguing that there is not a problem of free expression in America, but it's on a political level, not a university level. Their approach arguing that universities need to do more promotes the wrong solution. What people hear when the affirmative cries wolf saying that the problem is in universities, arguing that free expression under attack is instead political propaganda. Under the smokescreen of free expression, reactionaries will use the affirmative team's narrative to further their political agenda where free speech and free education just becomes restricted education. In fact, a student Harvard columnist, Julian Berman, writes that the greater support of free speech is a political talking point meant to censor education. Many agree that free speech is under threat at universities, but for the wrong reason. Does campus discourse reflect an ideologically diverse, cordially cohabitating smorgasbord of perspectives? This question, while important, only plays into the hands of conservative coalitions purportedly standing up for free speech. It's time for the left to expose the hypocrisy for what it is, a smokescreen that obscures a far more pernicious threat to free speech, one that comes from the right, not the left. And what is this threat? A nationwide culture war that systemically censors educators who dare to speak on subjects that conservative lawmakers deem off limits. That can result in the loss of employment, prosecution, and ultimately criminal penalties. This is the wrong free speech conversation. Instead, we should focus on the slew of new laws designed to chill speech by keeping certain discussions out of the classroom. Censorship par excellence. Instances of censorship are slipping through the cracks. We agree that the current political attacks against education are terrible. However, the affirmative sweeping claim that universities in the United States should give greater support to the freedom of expression on campus is the wrong starting point. Universities are a fantastic forum for free expression and discussion. Therefore, we should be asking questions like what can we do to fix polarization? And how can we increase expression outside of universities? Instead, the affirmative fuels an approach that props up right-wing talking points that is dangerous, ill-researched, and ultimately censors education. And I now open myself up to cross-examination. All right. Well, my first question is, you've said that the best type of education on college campuses occurs within the four walls of the classroom, but we have provided numerous examples of the four walls of the classroom coming under attack with professors being censured for expressing themselves freely. So how exactly would you respond to this? Yeah, so I guess first I would push back on your characterization that you've provided multiple examples. You have said that students censor themselves, which is not a problem of the university's policies, but students and partisan agenda, and one instance of a professor getting fired. When holistically looking at the ability to have free discussion and communication, the four walls of the classroom animate a public discussion, the development of knowledge and the free exchange of ideas, and in fact, the campuses are the best way to do this. All right. It's also been alleged that we should never trust polls because a handful of publications may have extended their headlines a bit too far beyond what the polls actually suggested. Have we done that in this debate? And if so, how? I would argue the narrative surrounding your couple polls about the students feeling censored within classrooms and perpetuating it as a crisis of free speech absolutely moves towards these sensationalist headlines that are critiqued in the Bradford Vivian evidence that is specifically talking about the polls of free speech and citing sensationalist headlines from the Wall Street Journal and more. So according to your Berman evidence in your speech, it says that 18 states have passed laws that restrict ideas inside the classroom. Does that not constitute a free speech crisis? 
Yeah, and we say that there is a free speech crisis. It's just not in the universities. It's a broader crisis about the American legislature censuring education and people's ability to speak publicly. Okay. Um, moving on to your Bradford Vivian evidence, how does this evidence address the restriction of freedom of expression if Bradford Vivian is primarily writing about trigger warnings? I would push back on the conception that this author is talking about trigger warnings. He does talk about trigger warnings in part of his book, but the pieces of evidence that we cite are specifically talking about selective focus when it comes to free speech and academic freedom. And lastly, do you have any evidence that campus discourse, whether that's in the classroom or in public spaces on campus, um, that that discourse reflects a diverse set of ideological perspectives? I believe your Berman evidence talked about that as kind of the goal. Yeah, so I, uh, there are a couple points in which we talk about this. First, our first piece of evidence that I have read talks about how the campus allows for an ideological and fruitful discussion, which could be indicative of a, a group of diverse ideologies. But secondly, the Berman evidence talks about how colleges are uniquely good at having these discussions and ideological, diverse, co co cordially cohabiting smorgasbords of perspectives. Is the exact word he uses. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Lance Hungar, and I'm a junior majoring in history here at Mary Washington. I stand with my par partner, Andrew, and affirm the resolution. Universities in the United States should give greater support to freedom of expression on campus. This debate itself is a powerful argument in favor of freedom of expression. College campuses need more rigorous testing of ideas like this debate instead of censorship. Now, the negative team has raised several arguments. First, they say that freedom of expression is not under attack. They reject student polls that say the opposite on the grounds that students do not understand the First Amendment or the concept of freedom of speech. But they ignore that the Atlantic polls in our first speech were not about the First Amendment, but instead centered on students' perception of their ability to speak openly in a classroom setting. This is a key distinction. Discourse is only as free or open as it is perceived to be. Additionally, if they claim students are poorly versed in free expression, that only furthers our argument that we have a unique opportunity to raise awareness about freedom of expression and educate through critical media literacy. In order to move forward as a civil society, we must start in the university, the culmination of our life preparation pipeline and be willing to have open discussions about complicated issues without falling prey to derogatory partisan tactics. The classroom is well suited to civil discussion because it is a laboratory for teaching and training. The negative team's only attempt to indict this point is to cite researchers who are talking about criticisms of trigger warnings, not freedom of expression. Their Berman evidence even explicitly mentions 18 states where freedom of expression is limited on campus, so the negative has conceded that there is a problem that must be solved now. Recently, an Indiana university found a student guilty of racial harassment for publicly reading a book on how college students were instrumental in opposing racism merely because the words Ku Klux Klan were in the title. Yet, according to Jay Stanley of the ACLU, freedom of expression was a key factor in the success of the civil rights movement. Many of those who participated in the marches, sit-ins, and rallies of the civil rights era were college students who were empowered by their freedom to express their views to advocate for change. The negative team's second argument against promoting free expression is that it is a smokescreen for a right-wing political agenda that restricts education. They ignore our evidence in both speeches that indicts both the left and the right. Conservative attempts to restrict curriculum or ban books like South Carolina's recent legislation that punishes state universities for assigning LGBT themed books to students are as harmful as liberal policies that lead to student self-censorship. The affirmative stands for inclusivity in dialogue through freedom of expression for everyone on the political spectrum. The beauty of freedom of expression lies in its explicitly nonpartisan nature. Finally, the negative states that government or public action would more effectively support freedom of expression. But where do we learn how to engage in political discourse? The university. The university is the training ground for politicians as well as members of the public. If we want a more open, tolerant society that can effectively debate ideas rather than censor individuals, universities must do more to support freedom of expression on the campus as they raise up the next generation of leaders. At the end of the day, 
We are one nation and more locally, one university. Each and every student and professor should not only feel welcome to express their views, but also be given the opportunity to learn from those who might disagree or offer different takes on a topic. That is how education happens. And that is why our universities are the key arenas where freedom of expression must triumph. And I'm ready for cross-examination. Fantastic, Lance. My first question is, do you think the free speech policies and environment at the University of Mary Washington is as you would consider good? Yeah, I believe so. Fantastic. Since the free speech policies and academic environment of the University of Mary Washington are good, do you think that there are any examples of students potentially self-censoring themselves here at the university? You know, I haven't seen that in my time here, and I think Mary Washington is kind of unique uh, in that sense. Classes I've been in, the professors are very cognizant of the fact that people do have different opinions, so they, you know, uh, allow for certain things or run the class in a certain way so that people don't have to self-censor. So I haven't seen that, but, you know, maybe it does happen. I haven't seen it. Sure. My next question kind of gets to your point of solvency. You argue things like critical media literacy. I'd like to mm -hmm. talk a little bit more about why you think that solves students self-censoring or not being able to discuss their opinions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think we have an education deficit. That's what our evidence has said. Um, and the education deficit comes from the idea that people and particularly students aren't educated about freedom of expression, about why it is so important and so vital. Instead, where students get their ideas from are often from, you know, the late night news or, or social media or, or places where polarization has really infected our national discourse. So we want to set up this other standard, critical media literacy, um, which which, along with you know general uh, support for freedom of expression, but this is something that essentially can train students' minds to think differently about people on the quote unquote other side. You know, sure. maybe they're people too, just like we are. Uh, we should have a conversation. Sure. I guess I'm interested in kind of how that works. How would a critical media class teach someone to entirely understand all of politics and figure out that of one discussion is better than another? Yeah, so uh, just a couple a couple caveats there. You know, I, I don't think students need to understand all of all of politics to have a conversation. Uh, and I, I think at the end of the day, we should be looking at the resolution, which asks us, you know, should universities support more freedom of expression? Um, so I think we need to look at this should question. And critical media literacy, while it can't teach students about every aspect of politics, can certainly teach students to you know take the good information and leave the bad uh, and not have a negative or judgmental view of other people. And so even if it doesn't solve every problem or is a panacea for, you know, every, every disease that infects our society, it's something that universities should be doing and should be supporting because maybe we can make a difference. And then referring, I guess, back to my first question I asked here, how do students having a better understanding of the media mean they feel more comfortable talking? Well, I think it's not so much that, you know, they feel more comfortable talking, but it's that they know that other students in the class or in this classroom setting won't judge them because they've had this uh, training that allows them to understand others' viewpoints uh, and then debate those if they disagree, not censor or judge the individual. Today, I will continue to negate the resolution that universities have no need to increase support for freedom of expression because this freedom is already well protected and not under attack. First, let's remember my first contention, that there is no assault on the freedom of expression on college campuses. Remember our evidence from Penn State professor Bradford Vivian and a host of other professors. Now compare this to their one poll and anecdotal evidence from a crisis. Our experts are qualified professors writing on unbiased academic sources that should be trusted over their sensationalist headlines, the very issue that Bradford Vivian addresses. Vivian also addresses that their polls should be rejected because they do not cite the poll directly and create a narrative of surrounding hyperbolized headlines meant to get clicks. Furthermore, it's impossible to know whether the quote crisis the affirmative cite, or cites is a random statistical noise based on one or two abnormalities or the beginning of a trend. The affirmative continues the problem of the sensationalist headlines by only making one or two examples of bad laws or bad cases from the university and extrapolating that there is a national crisis. Now, let's move to my second contention. While freedom of expression as an idea may not be partisan, those who use the rhetoric of freedom of expression have dangerous ulterior motives. 
our opponents claim that the freedom of speech is under attack due to censorship, but their claims to combat censorship just further censor people, completely defeating their alleged solvency. They cite Jeremy Young of PEN America reporting on a professor who was terminated after showing art perceived as offensive by Muslim students. The AF has misconstrued the idea of what freedom of expression is. As stated by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, freedom of expression includes the freedom to hold opinions and to receive and impart information and ideas without interferences of public authority and regardless of frontiers. Notice how the freedom of expression does not include freedom and immunity from backlash. The professor exercised her right to freedom of expression through showing their students an image that could be perceived as offensive. Muslim students then used their freedom of expression to express their discomfort over the image shown. The AF's supposed solution to the issue of freedom of expression not only does not protect the freedom of expression, but it absolutely diminishes it. Say, hypothetically, the AF did have their way and that this professor was now able to show this image for educational purposes with no retribution. With the AF solution in place, the rights of the students offended by the image would be ripped away from them. Those students would be censured and unable to express their opinion that the image was offensive and should not be shown. This scenario, although unfortunate that an educator lost their job, is a perfect example of our rights being protected and exercised. Art that may be perceived as offensive is shown, and those offended can speak up about it without fear of attack. In fact, focusing the argument that universities should place no restrictions on the freedom of expression leads to the dehumanization of students because they forgo the broader problem of political polarization from Penn State professor Bradford Vivian in 2022. First Amendment hardball in the context of campus misinformation additionally classifies some forms of speech as illegitimate as according to pseudoscientific narratives about the coddled or mentally fragile nature of college students. Tales of free speech crises on college campuses are highly useful to extremist groups that pressure the public, as well as private universities to accommodate First Amendment hardball or tactics designed to delegitimize speech, dignity, and rights of historically marginalized groups while nebulously claiming to defend free speech. Agents of campus misinformation who disseminate sensational warnings about free speech crises on college campuses count on media outlets and the public to accept their ostensible dispenses of free speech at face value. At the end of the day, you should force the affirmative to prove how they would create a censorship-free world, especially if that world continues to silence minorities by making them unable to speak freely for their opinion. The focus of the university, the focal point that universities are not doing enough to educate the freedom of expression and of our students is the wrong starting place. Ask yourself why they cite the legislature and not university policies. I now open myself up to cross-examination. So my first question is, uh, just at the end of your speech, you said that we have to prove how we would create a censorship-free world. Um, wouldn't you say that it's perhaps better that we prove that there should be less censorship in the universities? Do you think that's more in line with this debate? Uh, first, I would push back about that there is a censorship crisis in universities, but you continuously cite problems like book bannings and deteriorating dialogue within the United mm -hmm. States. In fact, you cite that Republicans do not feel comfortable about the things that professors are teaching their students. So you cite a broader political crisis, therefore you must stop that censorship as opposed to the one or two instances of censorship that you speak about on college campuses. Okay, so I guess how would you define a free speech crisis if it's not, you know, multiple states and multiple universities having these issues, you know, a large majority of students feeling like they have to self censor in the classroom like what to you would be a free speech crisis on the campus. A free speech crisis on the campus would be a place in which no student can express their own opinions, which we have contended that that is not true, especially since campuses are currently the best protectors of freedom of expression, whereas the outside world and the political realm is definitely not. Well, I'd like to ask you a bit about that definition. I mean, the statement, no student feels free to express themselves on college campuses. Are you not at all concerned with a chilling effect that may occur if many students feel they're not free to express themselves? I am not claiming that there are students that do not self-censor. There are some cases in which their universities do not support a holistic amount of free speech rights. But the narrative that this is a crisis only fuels political partisanship and creates sensationalist headlines that do not actually display what the problem actually is. The problem we should be discussing is why these book bans are in place, not whether Stanford University should place new policies in place to have a different type of speaker. And so in the interim, it is not desirable for universities to take attempts to expand their freedom of expression. We should just like shrug our shoulders and say, well, if you can't do it politically, you shouldn't do it at all. 
we would push back that, again, there's not a crisis happening within the college campuses. But secondly, the narrative surrounding the affirmatives is that universities are bad. And that is a terrible starting point, because saying that we should universities are bad and we should focus on them only fuels the narrative of partisanship that makes the debate worse. It makes more censorship happen. It works more political partisanship that happens within the world, meaning it censors more people. Sure. And my final question, in your interpretation of how we would resolve the Hamlin incident in which they fired an art history professor, you said that we would not allow the students to express their views or opinions at all. I'm not sure where exactly you're getting that, as I and I hope the audience has understood our arguments. They all should be free to express themselves. The university merely should not have fired them over it. Could you point to like an author who you have who would say that that's actually what our argument is supposed to be? The uh, second piece of Vivian evidence that I read in this speech specifically talks about the ideas of holistically protecting free speech rights means that minority movements that feel offended by some uh, some actions cannot take action when we are holistically protecting a more a larger attempt of free speech rights, like the professor showing offensive Im images towards the Muslim students. So that was an acceptable thing for Hamlin University to do. They should have fired the professor? I'm not saying that's an acceptable thing for the university to do. And in fact, that university has taken blame for that. But citing one example and claiming it is a holistic crisis is terrible for the partisanship of politics. All right, thank you. OK, uh, so we are now going to enter the audience Q&A portion of the debate. Uh, so if you folks have any questions for either the affirmative or the negative or for both teams, uh, you can put those in the chat and we will ask them. Uh, while you all think of questions, uh, I do have a couple. So first, I kind of want to get both the affirmative and the negatives uh, position on, is there a limit on what should and should not be protected? And follow up, who would make the decision of what should and should not be protected? Well, for the affirmative side, we would say that if there isn't a limit that should exist, it must be defined very broadly as there is an incredible danger in talking about freedom of expression, of over limiting what people feel like they can say. And we would particularly say in the case of universities in which academic discourse and the ability to debate ideas is so critical that that de definition must be exceedingly broad. Now, we would acknowledge there are certain types of speech that maybe should face censorship, like if a professor got up in class and just started shouting racial epithets. We're not saying that should be protected or promoted. But we're saying universities currently are drawing the line well, well short of that. And so, you know, obviously they need to do a little bit more to protect freedom of expression than they currently are. Sure. And our point is we do not have an exact definition of what should not be protected. However, our argument is that the status quo that universities currently take and the policies within the university still allow for fruitful discussion and fruitful education and great education for politics and everything that a university is uniquely good at. So whereas we don't have a definition of what should not be protected, we are we are arguing that the status quo is uniquely fine and the university's boards on free speech and policies on free speech like the University of Mary Washington's should continue to be in place and the university should get to decide that. Um, okay, so a follow-up question for the affirmative. How would the media literacy class or idea that you kind of promote to resolve some of this be freed from political viewpoints and political slant? So that's a great question. Um, and I like talking about this because of course it is a UMW alum who uh, is pushing this idea of critical media literacy. Um, but I think, I think the point of a critical media literacy course is that it's not free from political viewpoints and slant. Um, so there of course will be that in the class. That's what they're talking about. So whether that's the professor, whether that's the other students, you know, there's going to be viewpoints and slant that are debated. Um, so that's something that in, that in those classes, students can feel free to challenge their professors um, without any repercussions. They can challenge other students. They can be challenged themselves. Um, and so the whole point of actually looking into these issues, and we all have biases, uh, but the whole point of looking deeply and critically into these issues is that we learn as students to think about them, not just react or have a gut reaction to a sensational headline uh, or someone talking on TV or something that's being shared around on social media. Okay, uh, a follow-up question for the affirmative is what does it mean to give greater support? So besides media literacy courses, how else would this be actualized on a university level? Well, we would say that there are several ways it could be actualized, and we've provided them in our speech. One of them would be to reevaluate the speech codes that we've provided evidence is 
been imposing way too vague of definitions and standards and has lead, led students to feel that they may accidentally say something and be punished by the university, which is causing them to censor. And so universities should take a sort of stricter look at their codes to make sure that they are imposing very clear limitations on what is and is not prohibited so that students don't feel like they're being chilled from speaking. And we'd also say that universities also on a political matter should be free to challenge like the book bans that have been going into effect. They should take cases into the courts and they should clarify to students and professors that the university at least won't punish them for reading books that the legislature has said you shouldn't do or shouldn't read rather. Um, for the negative, uh, a lot of your argument seems to be predicated on the idea that currently universities are open places for discussion. Uh, what or what should universities do in situations where curriculum is being regulated by a state body that excludes uh, certain types of history or race theory or discussion of like LGBTQ history, uh, what should universities do in those situations? Sure. The universities should continue to do exactly what they are doing and teach to the best of their abilities. I do not think that it is a burden of the university or the university policy boards to change the way in which the legislature happens. Of course, there should be discussions about free speech and students can enact discussions and their own policy boards about why we need to change the political realm, but saying that universities are the ones that need to have this greater support to solve these problems within the curricula from the legislature, I do not think is the correct focal point, because as I said in my speech, it's saying that universities are the problem, and even if the argument in and of itself is not saying university is the problem, that's what the media portrays it as, which continues to say that education is bad and education is not doing well enough. So therefore, they should just continue to teach as well as they can until the broader political problem is changed. So going off of that for the affirmative then, if it's true that, uh, univ or if it's true that like state governments, federal governments, et cetera, have control over what university curriculum is, uh, how can you expect universities to prioritize free speech if they're ultimately bound by another body? Yeah, so, I mean, that is the case certainly for some state universities, um, but we've provided examples of other universities where this is an issue. You know, book bans aren't the only things we talk about, but the second area uh, is that the people who will be on the, our state legislatures or be our governor in the future, you know, they will go through the university system. And that's why we need to take this opportunity to affirm our support for freedom of expression, you know, on the university. So the next generation of leaders doesn't go down this path um, that many people and apparently in our, you know, current political system are of banning books and, and moving away from this freedom of expression in teaching and on the campus. Okay. I would also like really quickly just like to add that even in the case of state universities, state universities are still protected by the First Amendment, as are the professors at those universities. And so as federal courts have found in a couple of these, at least at the college level book ban incidents, they have violated the First Amendment when they have been challenged. So the control of legislatures over university curricula is far from absolute. OK, uh, one other question for the negative. Um, the affirmative is saying that a lot of university students struggle to speak their minds. There's a perceived culture of backlash. Should universities do anything to alter that? I think a, a very good example of university policies that attempt to combat this level of censorship that is just as our evidence shows kind of holistic within America is exactly what the University of Mary Washington does. Not only do we have a week of training before we come into our freshman year, and every syllabus day there are sections within free speech and no recording policies in the classrooms, but there are constant reminders and constant annual sources or uh, reviews of the policies within the, the University of Mary Washington that states what a student's ability to have free speech is. Therefore, they increase or at least attempt to increase some level of comfortability within classrooms. I know for myself, I have taken classes on constitutional reform, reform amendments where we talk about both sides of the aisle. So this instance of the university is doing a fantastic job about reiterating what their current policies are and saying that the students will ultimately be protected. Okay, and Avery, there's a question from the audience. Uh, if universities are uniquely good at cultivating diversity, how does the negative explain the fact that speakers who are repeatedly shouted down and heckled at universities seem to come exclusively from the right side of the political spectrum? Yeah, so I, this is a really interesting question. The Even though that 
there is a case of those speakers being from the right side of the political spectrum. I think the argument here is that the students feel secure in being able to express their opinions. The university is pushing in those speakers that, that have differing opinions from those students, and those students then express their freedom of expression by saying they do not like that speaker or heckle or speak up at the university speakers uh, or the speaker that the university hired, uh, they speak up at it, which means that even though the university hired a specifically politically oriented speaker, we are seeing diverse arrays of university knowledge and student ideological perspectives because both sides of the aisle are either listening or accessing their free expression to heckle or talk about the speaker. Okay, um, that concludes our audience Q&A period. So we will move on to the final rebuttals and then conclude tonight's debate. All right. Well, I'd like to thank you all for coming out this evening and giving us your time. I am still Andrew Hudgens, and I will be concluding our debate that universities should provide greater support for freedom of expression on college campuses. As we have continued to demonstrate Throughout this debate, there is a crisis in how universities are approaching expression on their campuses. We have seen professors fired from their jobs for merely showing artwork in a purely academic context. We've seen students feel chilled by vague speech codes that they feel will allow them to be persecuted simply for reading a book on civil rights because it has the title Ku Klux Klan in the title of the book. We have seen state legislatures attempt to manipulate and control how professors assign books on their syllabi, which is far beyond the powers that they are allowed to possess and is a clear violation of freedom of expression. And for all of these reasons, we state that this crisis is real and ongoing. The negative has tried to say we are citing only a few anecdotal pieces of evidence. But not only do we think that our surveys of public opinion polls, of speech codes, and of book bans have occurred in numerous states across the political spectrum, but I would also ask, at what point would they define a crisis? How many anecdotal evidences do we need before we can safely say that actually maybe freedom of expression isn't all right on college campuses. And when college campuses have such a unique and vital role in fostering the next generation and instilling into them a respect for the importance of free and open debate and expression, we would say that we should always err on the side of caution and assume that more expression is beneficial. And so, no, we have definitively, <clears throat> no, we should not assume there is not a crisis. We have definitively proven these incidences are real and happening. And it's not just that they're happening, but that they're happening from all sides of the political spectrum. Our dear friend, Mr. Avery A. Dover, wishes to explain this debate as a purely partisan one. We're just a bunch of right-wing hack jobs engaging in narrative building that will be used to smuggle in ideas now to control the debate. But in doing so, he has clearly ignored how we have actually articulated the free speech crisis on college campuses. We've provided examples both from the left in their attempts to impose vague free speech codes and from the right in their attempt to impose book bans on university campuses. We've said that it is all unacceptable and it all must be rejected. As my partner so eloquently pointed out, the beauty of freedom of expression is that it is bipartisan and that speech must be protected regardless of the political content. And we can never assume that a discussion over the existence of free expression is inherently political, nor should we refrain from supporting it just because of the risk that it might be. And this is particularly key when, as we have demonstrated throughout this debate, universities have such a unique ability to foster free expression by promoting things like critical media studies in which they will encourage students to engage with ideas and arguments, to see beyond the headlines and actually discuss them in a free and open manner, and by their unique ability to resist attempts to impose limitations on their free expression, both from the state legislatures as well as within the universities themselves. It's for all of these reasons that we continue to affirm the resolution that, yes, universities must give greater support for freedom of expression on their campuses. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Me again. It's Avery Dover. And today I will continue to negate the resolution that the crisis that is happening of free speech is not a crisis of universities. And in fact, creating sensa sensationalist narratives that say the problem is the university only fuels political backlash that inevitably hurts educators, creates unemployment, and much more damage than what is happening in the status quo. The affirmative continues to cite vague speech codes and professors fired. However, they say, when do we define a crisis? My answer is more than one professor. 
more than one pole, which is the only thing, the affirmative concite, that is happening within the universities. You should remember our critiques for their specific one pole. In fact, we indicted their idea of Jeremy Young, uh, their piece of evidence from PIN America, reporting about a professor who was terminated showing art perceived as Muslim students because they've misconstrued the idea of what freedom of expression is. We have said in that case, both the university professor and the students had the freedom of expression. Also, you should remember my first speech from the evidence of Bradford Vivian, who says that universities are in fact the best protectors of academic freedom, speech, and diversity today, because the manufactured outrage that the affirmative tries to create about student protest on college campus reflects an ex ex exceedingly selective focus about free speech and academic freedom. I would then ask you to remember some pieces of evidence I read in my previous speech that talks about what crisis is specifically happening. In fact, we argue that one poll or one idea is just a sensationalist headline that is just that is just political noise instead of an idea of an actual crisis. But instead, the a narrative of the crisis saying that the problem is with the universities actually fuels political rhetoric and means more dangerous alternatives. First, you should remember my piece of Bradford Vivian evidence from the last speech, that focusing on the arguments of the university should place no restrictions on the freedom of speech actually hurts students because it's foregoing the broader problem of political polarization. I would like you to think about all of the instances that Andrew cited in his last speech. He cited the vague speech codes, the professor being fine, but he focused on the book bans and then continued to say that universities were the problem. This debate has specifically focused on the broader political realm, citing that Republicans Republicans do not feel comfortable with politicians or with professors within the classroom, and then they say the university is the problem. This is a game of First Amendment hardball in the context of campus misinformation that classifies forms of speech illegitimate. It makes students censor themselves and only creates a further narrative of censorship that delegitimizes the speech, dignity, and rights of historically marginalized groups. At the end of the day, you should be asking yourself, is the current status quo on campus good enough to create a fruitful education, or should we prefer a narrative that education and campuses are bad, and instead not worry about the broader political problem? Thank you so much. Big round of applause to our debaters. Great job, folks. Uh, and many thanks to Gabe for moderating. A um, couple more things we're going to do here. Uh, we will be sharing a link to the research for this debate. That'll be posted on the team's website. Um, but I'm also about to post a poll on your screen. Um, and you're going to take a moment to think about which side you thought won the debate. All right. Hopefully you can see it now. Maybe ah, somebody voted. OK, so we're seeing it. Great. Um, and then I'm also going to background noise narrate the fact that I'm about to try to share my screen. We'll see if I'm successful at that or not. Ta-da. All right, I'm going to continue to give you folks a few more seconds to vote. Um, in the meantime, if you uh, if you've already voted uh, on your screen, you should see we've got a bunch of information about UMW debate. Um, you can follow us on social media. You can check out our website. Like I said, we'll have our research posted there. Um, you can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, or you could scan the QR code on your screen. I doubt anyone will actually do that right now, but you could. Um, and if you are a UMW student who is interested in debating, we'd love to hear from you. And there's lots of information about that on the website. Okay. This is earth shattering. Is anybody else planning on voting? No, because we are, everyone has voted. And for the second time in a row, we have a dead tie. Um, we have, let me get the results published here. Boom, we have eight people siding in favor of the affirmative and eight people siding in favor of the negative. Um, all right, well, it seems like we really resolved that one. Um, well, uh, a bunch of us did in preparation for this debate, we did have a number of conversations where it seemed as if this is one of the more knotty problems in trying to figure out which side uh, is right here. It seems as if there's parts of it that you could end up sympathizing with either side. So uh, thank you again to our debaters for having an illuminating discussion. And hopefully, even if uh, we didn't necessarily change your mind, you gave some more thought to an issue that, like I said, is a little more complicated than you may think at first blush. So thank you all for joining our conversation this evening, and we'll hope you join us for some of our public debates again next semester. Have a good night.